You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. They see a deer on a mountain. What are you going to do? There's so many different things we could we could look at. One of the things that you're really good at is knowing when to strike. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I am joined by the uh, the, fu- the infamous, femi- the, the, the renowned... No, no, no. no. Uh, he, he's the modest, <laughs> no, that. the yes. modest, stealthy <laughs> hunter, Ryan Lampers. And today we're going to talk a little bit about mule deer. And uh, today's subject, if you listen to this show, you're going to learn uh, kind of... You're going to get in Ryan's head on uh, when to do a stock like how to do a stock, when to, when to make the, make your move. And uh, I wanted to talk about you, talk to you about this because we've been on a lot of hunts together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you're really good at is knowing when to strike and, and uh, when not to strike, when to hold back, when to watch, when to move. And I've observed this, especially on my own hunts. I, I, I have a tendency to want to just go. I see the deer. I know where it's at. I want to go. And I've learned from hunting with you to be so much more patient than I used to be. Um, and it's, it's led to much more fruitful uh, hunts at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. The other temptation, the other thing I've seen you do is not only do you hold back, you know, on when to strike or not to strike, but you also are really good at going, okay, um, I'm going to manage my resources. I only have so many days in the field. I have, I only have so many opportunities to do a stock and a stock can take six hours, eight hours, or the whole day. Those are also hours that could be spent on trying to find a better situation, a better deer in a better spot. And so for you, it's, it's hard for me to walk away from a buck I like that's bedded and you're like, well, you're not getting that deer. Like you can kind of tell and you say, you know, I'm going to go find another deer over here. That's, that's killer. But, and then I'll check back on this deer tomorrow or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to get into your head on that stuff. Uh, and just to kick it off, I'm just going to talk about an example this year where, you know, we're out hunting muleys and, and we see a couple of bucks coming down and, in uh, the snow. And we, we decide that, you know, when I see those deer, I just want to go, I want to go kill them now. And you're like, (laughs) you're like, nah, let's wait and let's wait and let's wait some more. Let's have some breakfast. Let's start a fire. And it's just like (laughs) fricking a dude, Um, you know, when are we going to go? And um, you know, kind of explain in the end, there's a lot of reasons why, and I've picked those up, but yeah. Um, what are your criteria? You know, when you spot a deer, so what are the, some of the things that you're, you're considering before you do your stock? Oh man. Yeah. I think, uh, I think there are, there's so many different things we could, we could look at and there's, you know, a million things that go into every decision, just, you know, time of year, the area you're in wow. your time that you have, I mean, we could talk about all of them, but I think number one is, uh, you know, it, it, is it a buck that makes you happy first, right? That's an easy one. Like you're not going to want to, you know, climb a couple thousand feet just to get better eyes on a buck that you're pretty darn sure isn't going to be the one for you. Um, and then, you know, obviously is he going to be in a good spot that you can actually have a crack at? And then we could speak to bow hunting. We could speak to rifle hunting. Um, I think right now we're probably speaking a little bit more about rifle, Um, we have a a fresh rifle hunt in our head, but yeah, I think, um, you know, we all have these goals when we go into a hunt, whether it's maturity level, um, you know, you and I tend to just love the idea of killing a buck in the last couple of days of the hunt (laughs) for whatever reason that is. So we're never seem to be rushed. It's, it's kind of cool to maximize your time out in the mountains. Uh, maybe if we didn't like being in the mountains so much, we would try to knock those deer out and take more risks and settle for something that 
wasn't quite what we were hoping for, but you know, we got goals. You and I got expectations. Uh, we got, we got something that we know in our head maybe we can't even explain it, but we know in our head that's got something that I want. Yeah. So tell me like, let's say, I think a lot of guys, um, they, they don't sit back and wait Mm -hmm. before and, and watch a deer for very long before they make their approach. Yeah. You know, what is your advice to someone? They, they see a deer on a mountain, let's say Mm -hmm. they see, they just spot them. It's first light. Uh, he's kind of nosing a doe a little bit. What are you going to do? Um, I think number one, if, if he's a good buck and, and he's in a killable spot, you know, we're going to make all those decisions, you know, at the time, but, um, we could, let's boil this down to like a specific hunt this year. Let's tell a story about this hunt. Okay. Um, we, we see a buck, he's nosing some does time of year, mid to late October, you know, they're just starting to get a little bit ready. Um, can you count on that buck to be there for several days in a row parked on those does? Probably not, not as much as you can, in my opinion, um, on a big mature buck in mid November, uh, those does are going to be, you know, going into estrus. He's going to park it on the, on that group and stick with a much longer or cut one off and just, you'll be able to find him versus October timeframe when they're just getting sniffy. They're checking them. They're backing out. They're going to the next base and they're checking those. They may come back, but the chances of you being able to watch that same buck over and over day after day are pretty dang grim. Like there's a possibility, but likely not like they're going to move on you. Um, and then, like I said, November's a different story. Uh, you find a secluded doe or two or three or six, and you find a, a big mature buck at that time frame. Mm-hmm. My opinion is he's probably not going to leave those does um, for a while. He's he's way more likely to stick to those does. You're going to have a lot more time. October when they're just getting snippy, uh, you know, you just may not. And so I'm thinking of this year we had a we had a buck. Is Cal's buck? Cal's buck. Like we we well we had two bucks. So we had a compact buck, right? Mm-hmm. He didn't excite us that much. Um, we were curious if we weren't really seeing them, like we thought we were seeing them. Like we were like, after we watched him kind of push Cal's buck off the, the entire group of does, um, Cal's buck did a little walk of shame. And yet Cal's buck, we, we thought was way bigger. Mm-hmm. And then you got the Makes compact you think twice. <laughs> then you got the compact sitting there. Like he just pushed this much bigger but we determined was much bigger buck away. So maybe then we start second guessing. Like, are we, are we seeing this as like a brow times that Brian's going to pass on and, mm-hmm. and it's going to kick us in the butt down the road. We're going to wish we'd shot him. <laughs> um, so, you know, we had a lot of those things happen to us this year where we were in that late October timeframe. Now, the nice thing about where we were, um, we weren't really expecting those bucks to stick. Like, we were just wanting new bucks to keep coming in and checking. And so we had, we found ourselves in a, in a sweet little basin. It had multiple groups of does, five or six different small groups of does. I mean, you couldn't ask for any more than that on that October 20th to November 1st timeframe. So they're going to come in, um, you know, compact buck was one that we had questions about, but we also had expectations of grabbing something that just excited us. Mm-hmm. Cal's buck excited us. And then, you know, that's obviously why we made the play on Cal's buck. And, uh, in the end, an even bigger buck came into play and he excited us more, but <laughs> right. <laughs> way more. The day, so, <clears throat> I was going to say go the ahead. day we went after Cal's buck, you know, we saw him up, up there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, with the does put eyes on him. It was our last day consequently. So again, it was a, it was a, we were going to go no matter what. Yeah. But we didn't go for hours. No, no, no. We, so in that scenario, yeah, we had, it's the last day situation. Like this is it. We got to pick up that buck. And we, 
we were hoping that we would. Um, Cal's buck had moved from one side of the basin to the other, checking another group of does like they do. And uh, Cal picked up that buck in an area where the does could have led him up and over a ridge. And in our trek to get there, we may have lost sight of him, lost sight of him for good. Um, it was going to be a sunny day. We knew that we knew they were going to bed down, um, somewhere somewhat close to where they were feeding. Cause it was kind of like a browse field of, you know, they were, they had a lot of area that they could go any direction. Um, but if they cut up and over the ridge, we'd lose them forever. And we would need to reposition ourselves on, let's say the right side of the basin to get eyes on. So tell me and in our transition tell me this why wouldn't why didn't we just go once we saw him feeding there you know mm-hmm. in the like we knew right in the general vicinity why 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 wouldn't a guy just go what was the risk in doing that i think a couple things um so on that last day the risk was he disappears he beds down where we don't see him and they can just disappear into that even open face like that they can disappear in that browse his his does, he may split off from his does at that time. Um, he's not married to those does at that time of year, but he is checking them. And so oftentimes they'll, they'll split away from them and they'll go bed in a spot where they're really hard to, to locate. So we wanted to watch that buck bed down. Um, but when we, that first was our spotted intention. Him, we fought, spotted him at first light though, pretty yeah. much right at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And they were on their feet for a couple of hours before yeah. before he does bed down down yeah and uh so what's in that couple of- w- w- why not just run up there what's been your experience why not just run up there at first light when we saw him and get on him while he's still on his feet with all those does what's why 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 not that approach instead of the one you you subscribe to yeah i think i think it all had to do with um potential to lose sight of where he ended up um we knew he was the buck we wanted he was in a spot that we could kill him if we watched him bed down. He could get away from us if we didn't see where he bedded down. Um, and the does were not a tight knit group. They were kind of spread out. He could go right with a doe that beds out of sight, or he could cut right into the drainage where we had eyes on him all day long. And we would be able to make a play on him and have, because we had to gain what 1800 feet of elevation to get on him. Yeah. And in that time we were going to lose eyesight we were going to lose us, i think it took us about an hour if i remember right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to get there yeah now, so you, you know we I paid mean, attention to the wind we 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 tried to make sure every base was covered because again it was our last day um, i mean had we left that first light assuming mm-hmm. we didn't spook anything on its feet or in between us we could have been there and still seen him on his feet yeah but we also couldn't, we could, we also could have missed him and he could have just jetted out of there because we so remember. What, so what you're were saying is with, there's, there's risks with both approach approaches yeah. to your way of thinking. And in your experience there, they both have pros and cons, yeah. but you're thinking that watching him until he beds and being patient and holding back yeah. yields usually a higher rate of success than the, than, than charging up their, Absolutely. Light. If we could get eyes on him bedding, if he was to bed within eyesight, we had him. Like we had him nailed. Um, if he was to go up and over to the right side of the ridge, then we would know we can still get a good play. He's not going to go far. We got to not even cross creek. We got to stay on the right side to get eyeballs back on him. Um, so we had we we were in a great position, but there's far more risk. And just zipping up there, losing sight of him when we're in the creek, because then we just have no idea where he is um, versus letting him bed down. Now, we still screwed up. I mean, we thought we saw him bed down and we saw him. I still I think he video. did. I have I still him on video bedding down. But then in our transition to from where we were to get up to where, you know, we sat watching for him to unbed himself. <laughs> He got up, man, and yeah, we he were rolled further. So we were, we were, we had the most beautiful stock and steak ambush point stake out um, oh, yeah. on a bed. That there was no, yeah, on a stump. <laughs> there was no deer there, but it was epic. 
It was. And all he had been like in our transition to up to that point where we had a good uh, shooting position and that one hour window, basically. Yeah. He got up and he just moved further into the cut a little higher on the hill, further to the left. And um, fortunately though, we had seen those two does. If you remember, there were two does that had bedded in there and we, we just, when he bedded the first time the does went over to the left and they kind of bedded. We just had the expectation. He was going to stay close. He wasn't jetting out of the country. The The sun was up at that point, blue skies. Um, they were probably going to be somewhere, you know, close to each other. And he wasn't just going to go hit a ridge and, and start cruising. But um, yeah, I mean, it worked out well for us in that, in that, on yeah. that specific situation. Um, but yeah, I would say it's all about percentages. I, I felt much better about waiting on that buck, trying to get a really good idea and, not let him out of our sight to where we don't know if he's right or left. We don't know where our position needs to be to get that shot when he does bed down. Um, I would have felt pretty uh, low percentage just bombing straight up there and losing sight of him yeah. um, before that happened. So um, a couple, you know, last year I was in Arizona uh, hunting a buck and you know this buck was covered up in 20, 30 does all the time. And we were looking at him one day, uh, and sometimes if the wind was right, I could get on the edge of the herd and then hope he kind of came my way or gave me an opportunity. But sneaking up on the whole group was pretty tough. You were standing there one day, the day before I killed him, and you're like, yeah, today's probably not the day. (laughs) He's in the center (laughs) of like 30, 50 does, like some insane number of eyeballs and ears, uh, pretty hard to get to. And you're like, um, you said to me, I need to find a deer in a better situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, now, you know, I think that's super, that takes a lot of wisdom. Uh, how do you know, you know, and, and what's your, what's your, you're, again, you're going back to odds. You're being mm-hmm. efficient, I think, because you could spend the whole day watching him. Yeah. And it might be fruitful. The ID, the mm-hmm. odds were he's just going to stay there all day. Nobody was out, you know? Yeah. Um, he'd probably be there the next day, maybe in a better spot. It all depends on it. Is that like, that was the buck that you wanted because you, you had been chasing that buck. Um, it wouldn't make any sense to leave that buck because he was in a spot where he, we just needed a couple things to go right. Mm-hmm. He needed to get out on an edge of those does. He needed to put himself where there, he wasn't surrounded with those. I remember when I got there, you guys were glassing him. And it's like, oh man, there's that buck that you guys have been talking about. And you're like, well, what would we do? What do we do here? It's like, well, let's start looking around because we're not getting that buck today (laughs) unless he changes something, keep a set of eyes on him, but let's start looking around for something else that, um, that maybe actually we may have a chance at, which is, so I started looking around. Yeah. Pretty much what I did. I just kept eyes on him. You were looking for more deer. Uh, yeah. better better stockable and there's another buck in the area that was somewhere that was nice. that's who we were looking for yeah, yeah. Big old thing. and so yeah. i was like well you know and then sure enough at the v- very end of the day he did put himself in a pretty and it maybe it would work if some things went right mm-hmm. and uh so i got into position real quick and i i was 70 75 yards or something from him but it wasn't a shot i felt good about and they didn't know i was there and i backed out uh, it was tempting to take that shot, like mm-hmm. super tempting. And yeah, and I'm like, you know, that's not a great shot. And, and, uh, figured it's not a shot Ryan would take. So, um, <laughs> I'll wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. it works out. It was hard. Yeah. It was hard to leave that, that situation and come back the next day. But the next day, uh, he did split off with his dough and mm-hmm. became highly vulnerable. And then I shot him and, and I think, um, so keep an eyes on him, but there was a couple of times earlier in that day where I'm like, well, I could force it and I could go here and I could do that. And you're kind of like the voice of reason going, no, you can't. (laughs) That's a lot of does, dude. (laughs) Like that's a lot. I mean, that has to, you just need to be patient and you need to wait and you really need to, to hang back and don't, 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 uh, you know, you can't. Well, I think yeah. a lot of hunters, myself included, struggle with 
the balance between um, every every stock is a risk. Every stock is a gamble. But I I see you like really have a knack for going, okay, he's killable or no, he's not killable. I'm just going to wait. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and how do you explain that? I don't know. I think it's experience. I think you blow up enough stocks over the years. You realize um, there's certain ones that are worth going for. And there's certain ones that just makes more sense to sit back. And, you know, you are extremely patient with that buck. And what happened in the end, you got a nice inside of 40, I believe it was, or yeah. somewhere right in there side of 40 yard shot. Um, and that was just uh, making the best out of that one opportunity he gave you and having the days to do it. So, you know, you go in and you blow it up and there's your shot and it's gone. And it was a low percentage play. Um, you know, I think over time you just start to realize this is a high percentage. That was a low percentage, <laughs> but you know, the young guys, they're just going to make that. They're just going to have to do go through those, um, those mistakes and, eventually they'll get a knack for it, I guess. Yeah. How do you explain your gut telling you um, that's a high percentage, low percentage? But when they're surrounded by 25 does, <laughs> let me tell you, that's a pretty dang low percentage uh, yeah. trying to finagle your way in there on these super wary deer. Well, uh, low percentage. I, I asked you, uh, you know, before we started the call, some things you threw out some things like, <clears throat> okay, some criteria you're looking at is, you know, how many does are around them? Uh, yeah. what's the weather like, you know, do I have w- wind cover or, or things like that? Um, yeah. you know, is he bedded or is he still, is he just chasing and wandering, you know, mm-hmm. is, uh, are there other people also in the area that, that are trying to find the same deer, you know, so do you gamble today or do you just watch him today and go the next day, mm-hmm. you know? these are things, how many days do you have left in the hunt? Like if it's the last day, it's like Geronimo, yeah. you just, you know, you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go for it. Still play it smart, but go for it. Um, kind of like what we had happen this year, but yeah, you know, what's the weather in the next couple of days going to do? Uh, you know, do you have a potential for a blizzard conditions, fog, things like that, uh, where you're watching it and you're going to be worried about even being able to get eyes on the mountain or is it going to be comparable to the day you have going on? at that time or is there wind or um prevailing wind is great i mean love we all love some some noise cover with winds um archery as well as as rifle i feel like um you know and also if you got a bluebird day out the potential for that buck to get up after he's bedded down that late season october november november they get up um but in october you know, before the rut has really kicked off, chances are he's going to be bedded for a lot longer. Um, and you got much more opportunity to um, take the time to get to him versus November. It's about the does they're up and down. They're trying to roost those out of their beds and, mm-hmm. and all that. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's almost more similar to like archery hunting in, in August, you know, they'll grab a bed and they'll generally they'll, grab a bed or two beds a day and for the most part they're in those beds all day long so you have these long windows to make your best play on those bucks if you you got the wind right or you got a little bit yeah we we utilize the weather and the forecast with the garmin in reach typically yeah that's what we have service through and weather is huge and it it determines like where you put your camp where you want to set up and what bowls you want to look for and Um, you know, if we wouldn't have had weather coming in, say on, on this latest hunt, Mm -hmm. we would have went higher. Like we would have went more towards summer range. You know, if we didn't have any snow crop in the upper thousand, 2000 feet off, um, and no big, big systems coming in to get the deer moving, there's no way we would have plopped it down in that basin that we were in. Uh, we would have went way higher top of the mountain, um, they would have been spread out a lot more, but yeah. we knew we had a little bit of, you know, we a couple thousand feet up and we got a, we got a layer of snow. Um, and there's a point where you don't see tracks in it anymore. So they're below that line and we've got uh, great potential for more snowfall for multiple right. days in a row. Man, that's a winning combination that, you know, you put yourself in the right bowl 
you're going to see some movement come through there. And, and boy, we sure did. We didn't see high numbers, but we had the, the bucks that we wanted come through and we're able to grab them. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, a lot of hunters want to come out West. They, that, that are from the East. They want to learn about muley hunting. Some Western hunters still haven't been able to put an arrow in a mule deer on a spot and stock type hunt, or they're just not sure how to get a tag for a late season rifle hunt, like what we're doing during the rut. Yeah. And, uh, you have a Western hunting summit that you Mm -hmm. put on each year. This year, you actually have a mule deer specific summit. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that for all those guys that are listening that dream about kind of getting out West or just want to improve their, their game right now on mule deer. Yeah. Pretty much have the lock on, I think the best instruction there is available to help guys get it done. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was excited about the, this year's Western hunting summit. So the muley specific summit is our, um, second one of the year. It's going to be June 16th through the 19th. And we're on a piece where we actually get a glass up mule deer. We'll see a lot of elk and bear too. Um, but the piece of property we're on just has a lot of animals. So we'll be able to talk through stocks, um, talk through all those, those like like in-person situations while we're on the mountain, like, what would you do here? And we've got, gotten a lot of those questions in the past. And so, yeah, I've assembled a hefty crew of guys that are pretty dang good. You know, the guys that are like, the guys that excite me that I want to watch all the time are this consistently successful on mature animals. Um, that's why every year Brian Barney is, is at every summit that I, we put on. Brian Barney is a machine. He's really good at his craft, his shooting, his physical, physical physicality is everything he does, his scouting, his actual tips and tactics. When he sees a buck, he's a great guy to lean on, talk to. Um, he's way more talkative and personable than I am. So it's great to have him (laughs) at these events because he, he, uh, you know, somebody asks him a question, he'll go on for 30 minutes and, and answer everything. He's a wealth of knowledge. And he's, yeah. he is the host of the Eastman's Elevated podcast, mm-hmm. which yep. you should listen to only after you've completed all the gritty podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's a fun guy. Um, it's fun to try to beat him uh, on the archery course as well. He comes out, he shoots, um, you know, we do the challenges, 3d courses, get in groups. Um, you can have Brian come shoot with you if you want. And then it's not just Brian, man. We've got, you know, Brady Miller. He's, uh, another stud when it comes to mule deer, that guy, he's much more into the rifle side of things. Um, but he's been extremely successful. Brady's really well versed in all things, mature mule deer. Yeah. Um, and he's, uh, he's good at educating and answering questions. So he's going to be there, not only doing a presentation, but he'll be there for the duration so that he can get all those questions answered, talk about shooting, whether it's rifle. Um, he's a great guy to lean on for that as well. And then, you know, we've got Robbie Denning. Uh, most people know who Robbie Denning is. Robbie, uh, we were just at the expo. I watched his seminar down there. That was pretty his cool. seminar is so good. It's always It so is good. good he puts on a great one. Um, and that guy is fun to be around. He's a ball of energy. He's always, you know, willing to, um, take the time and talk to everyone, answer all questions. So Robbie's a great guy to have. That's a, I mean, that's a powerful lineup right there. Um, Yeah. Yep. And then we have the great Brian call is going to be there this year. (laughs) He's going to be talking all things Neil there. Yeah, I am nothing. Uh, he'll like talk those. your ear off. I'm nothing like those three <laughs> hunters. I, uh, if you want to, um, yeah, no, well, I'm going to be there. I'm going to hang out and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, um, we got, uh, yeah, a few other guys too. Uh, depends on which summit. So also Tony Treach, he's going to be there. Tony's a great guy. He's a wealth of knowledge. Um, whether you want to talk to him about his, off the charts scouting that he does every year. I mean, that guy does some next level scouting, like nobody can. Um, he, uh, and it's funny. I was talking to Tony. He's like, 
you know, we can talk, there's lots of things we could talk about, you know, mule deer and everything else. And this is a mule deer event, but for you, uh, whitetail guys, even you could talk to Tony about Western whitetail, I guess, if you want to just do it away from the rest of us. Um, but no, Tony's there to answer any and all things. He's great, you know, um, with his gear reviews, education on that and just his tactics. Cause that, that's another dude that's uh, been really successful with the bow. Um, and, um, yeah, he'll be a great guy to have there as well. And this is a multi-day event. Uh, yeah. there's, there's outdoor activities you're going to do. Um, yeah, so it's four days. Um, we're going to be doing some educating. We're also going to be doing some climbing up the mountain, glassing, uh, overnight camping, we're, we feed everybody for all four days and then we're going to be doing a lot of shooting. So Joel Turner is going to be at every event this year as well. Uh, if you need instruction on rifle, you need instruction on archery. Joel's your guy, obviously shot IQ. Um, if anybody has seen what his son Bodie Turner is doing right now, you'd be blown away and realize you need to listen to Joel. If you want to be a really, really good shot. And we had him there last year at a rifle event and, uh, the guy's incredible when it comes to that as well. He's got some pretty cool techniques and ideas on how to shoot better. So he's going to be around and, and yeah, the event, like I said, four days, we've got big 3d course, let me 3d targets all over the place. And then we've also got a, um, a steel target range for guys that do want to do a little rifle stuff. You got any country music that. stars coming this time? <laughs> Besides Dave Brinker. <laughs> Breaker's going to be there. Uh, yeah, we do actually. So on the mule deer event, we've got, um, I don't know if guys are know about Kenton Bryant, but I love his music. Really good stuff. He's a hunter. Uh, he's coming. He's really excited to come and, and hang with us at the mule deer event as well. So, um, yeah, he's, he'll be a good addition. We're going to do some music up on the mountain with Kenton. Um, that's really yeah. cool. I, I'm excited for the, uh, the event you, you have, uh, seats still available, but they're selling mm -hmm. out pretty quick. You did a pre-sale thing. Yeah. Um, the, the, for whatever reason, elk goes really fast. So most of the elk spots are all full. Uh, we got a few spots left for Muley and then the combo event is our last event. Um, and we've got some interesting deals. We have, uh, um, well, we're going to have some kids there at that last one. So yeah. we're going to have a bunch of activities for them. Uh, Sam Davis is going to be there. Uh, he's, he's, a another muley slayer, a uh, ton of respect for Sam and what he's able to accomplish. But, um, yeah, we got some, some local folks, uh, you can't go wrong at any of the events. No, there's, but, uh, there's speakers can't. galore. There's speakers and galore. All, all, good. all, all the events that you're doing have, they accomplish what they they're you're meant to accomplish you walk away yeah the goal is to answer like any and all questions anybody has when they get there they're also, and whether that's through a presentation or them just asking it and having it answered while we're hiking or sitting down at the end of the day eating or or whatever um we will get them answered it's empowering and it does also put you in contact with lifelong friends because pretty much mm -hmm. everyone meets one or two people that then become their hunting partners it seems oh like. yeah for sure <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the, um, the guys in the past that have done these, these sem uh, summits with us, you know, now they got Barney's number and they get a text mm -hmm. Barney or myself or, or Brady or, you know, Robert Hanneman or, you know, for tag stuff. And, and they just, yeah. they have access and they, they build these good relationships and they've kind of got a pipeline to get all their questions answered from that point forward. So it's good, but yeah, we get a lot of people that show up, they meet other guys and now they're, now they're hunting buddies out there chasing whatever elk deer, you name it. <clears throat> um, pretty cool to see. we got a pretty good community going on there. Um, if they use the code gritty in the last mm -hmm. few spots you've got, they're going to save yep. Yep. a little bit of money. Yep. Save a whole lot of money. Okay. Yep. Save, save a hundred bucks. Up save a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, what's the budget? What do they need to have to sign up? So as far as like things that they would need to bring, like no, what they like, need to come. That's okay. an interesting, I think they can figure that out, but some people are yeah. just going to go, well, what does it cost? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the price right now is 1649. So if you run the code gritty, you get a hundred dollars off that. 
And what that includes is uh, all four days, obviously, we do a lot of giveaways. Um, folks that show up get quite a bit of product from our partners. And then, um, like I said, all meals covered. We all stay on the ranch together all four days. And what what I hope guys can do is show up on the Wednesday mm-hmm. and be with us through with Wednesday evening. We camp out, stay with us through Sunday afternoon. We usually try to get guys out of there on the Sunday at about two o'clock. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good time. And this year, like I said, we're on a new place, uh, even more, you know, heavily loaded with animals than where we've been in the past. So we're going to see a lot of, you know, those bulls are growing pretty good mid June, you know, you kind of see where they're at. So some That's of those cool. bulls would be pretty impressive. It's pretty um, awesome to be in Montana in the mountains in June. It's hard to beat June in Montana. I know. It, it is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've got, and we've got this really nice creek running right through the property too. Um, I know last year I was trying to wrangle Joel back in. Guy was always out fishing, catching those brook trout and things on the pond. We got some great fishing too. So a lot of guys end up doing that and uh, getting out the fly rod and going and fishing at the end of the day. I love it. I love it. So folks, um, if you're interested, they go to what Western hunting, Summit. Western hunting summit.com yep. Western hunting summit.com. We'll have a link in the description field of this video. If you're listening to the podcast, just go to the Brian call gritty, uh, YouTube channel and you'll find, uh, you'll find, uh, this, this episode in, in the description field that's there. You can also just go to Western hunting summit.com and then use the code gritty and you'll save a hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. And if you want to support Ryan, uh, in other ways, you've got your stealthy hunter rifle covers, you got stealthy yeah. hunter, uh, glassing pads, mm-hmm. uh, and you got some nutritional supplements that we both hammered yeah. down on. Yeah. My wife's, um, built a pretty good lineup of, uh, real good nutrition supplements. So yeah, we both use those. CBD, turmeric, krill oil, all the things that uh, keep us old fogies uh, stomping up mountains. That's right. Uh, use the code gritty. It helps us both out. Shop at Stealthy. And um, I think that's it, dude. Let's do this again. Uh, mm-hmm. I have another muley topic I want to hit with you. I thought this Wait. one would, would people could find interesting, but I got some more. The list goes on. So that's we'll good. get together again in a couple of days. So. That's it for today, folks. We're signing off. Thanks for tuning in and stay gritty.